Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Hammurabi. I am your host, Megan Lewis, and today I am joined by Dr. Kara Cooney, who is an Egyptologist I'm sure almost no one needs an introduction to, but Kara, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a delight. Um, when I have new guests, I usually ask them if they could give a very brief rundown of how they got into Egyptology. Would you yeah, mind sure. sharing that? Um, it's the, the typical round school, enjoying school and loving dead people so much that it was just the only option. Um, it's the story of me being um, privileged and white and um, upper middle class such that I could take on a, a degree of such um, uh, leisure. <laughs> I don't feel like it's very leisurely anymore. Um, like my brother, you know, he loves history and he became a lawyer. So I think he felt not that my parents pushed him into it, but he felt a different social pressure than I did, uh, having been born in the 70s. So um, it's it's one um, question that Egyptologists usually don't ask each other because there is no real logical answer. It's illogical, it's mad, it's ridiculous for us to spend our lives studying ancient dead people, but it's the way that I see the world around me best. I see it best through the lens of antiquity. And that's how I understand force and military. It's how I understand economy. It's how I understand um, sexual power. It's how I understand all kinds of things. So, yeah. Thank you. Excellent answer. Um, and we're talking today about uh, Egyptian monotheism and how it may or may not have influenced Israelite monotheism. Yeah. Like, yeah. we're just going to put our hands up and say, probably quite speculative here. So, you know, don't hold us to it. Uh, but uh, Kara made a, a one-line comment in... Um, what did I say? Recently. It was in the, the Sasa um, conference when you gave your keynote and you were like, Egyptian religion may have influenced Israelite monotheism. And I basically emailed you immediately after that and said, that was amazing. Is there okay. any way to okay. come and, and talk about that? And you said, no one else will, but yes, I can do that. Um, so I appreciate you coming and doing it. Um, when, we, when we talk then about Egyptian monotheism, exactly what are we thinking about? And can we even call it monotheism? Um, it, it's um, very debated amongst Egyptologists. And when I talk about Akhenaten's religion, because it is really just Akhenaten's religion that, that we're discussing, though that religion was indeed accepted by many of his elites and, and potentially imposed on others, there, there is great pushback to calling it monotheism. But in, in my opinion, and in the, the chapter that I wrote recently on Akhenaten in this book, um, the Good Kings, I do take on the, the monotheism discussion quite um, openly. And like anything else, Akhenaten's religion is a process. It's not uh, created as a one and done, you know, just coming down fully constructed from the sky. It's something that takes um, root in his mind and is formed over his 17 year reign. It, it changes throughout that time period. And it starts out um, not as, as so many things do when rulers implement great change. It starts out taking in many of the things that elites are familiar with, um, different gods and goddesses, Reharakti, Ma'at, um, elements that they can connect to. And then as time goes on, it removes those elements and becomes more pure. That's a dangerous word, but I'm using it purposefully. Um, it becomes something that's... Um, more exclusionary and um, more true, uh, perhaps to his vision, what his original vision was, we'll never know, but it's something that changes over time. Um, and then if you read the texts, you know, the the great hymn to the Aten and, and, and other things, you see that the, the Aten, the sun disk is perceived in Akhenaten's mind, at least as something that is unique, that is one, that is single, um, and that other divinities do at the beginning are lesser, right? And then uh, there are none um, compared to him. And and then you see the iconoclasm developing later as well. You don't see Akhenaten going out and destroying statues of other divinities or reliefs of other divinities, particularly Amun Ray, king of the gods. You see that later. Um, it's something that an authoritarian leader generally develops over time. So you create your your um, shock and awe, and then you implement it slowly 
Um, I mean, rather quickly in a 17 year reign, we're, we're talking about, you know, 12 years of development, mm -hmm. but, but by the end, to me, it does seem to be, we're talking about the world's first monotheism. If you don't like the word monotheism, then, then you could say it's a religion centered on, on one divinity, you know, I don't know what the difference would necessarily be. And then from my own perspective, you know, my, my full name is Kathleen Mary Cooney. So I grew up um, very Catholic, right? And the way that I understand monotheism is, is a very complicated one. And people have all kinds of ways of squaring this in their own heads. You know, Christianity developing and then being forced into polytheistic cultural milieus, then take it takes on a, a mechanism of polytheism within a monotheistic um idealistically base and so in in my um religion growing up you could worship the mother mary as a goddess mm -hmm. that is how it is done <laughs> it's not it's not any different in in my estimation you go to her chapel you make prayers to her she can answer you that is polytheism in practice. And you can do this with the Trinity. You can do this with a number of saints. God is split up into a number of different parts. And if we can accept that as monotheism, then I, I see no trouble with accepting Akhenaten's religion as monotheist. Mm -hmm. And um, the reasons for him doing that are, uh, are many and, and uh, can be discussed. Yeah. Thank you. So how, to what extent then do you see Akhenaten's religion as being um, accepted and practiced by Egypt as a wider um, geographical area, or was it purely limited to the king and his immediate um, contemporaries? I do believe it's the latter. And I think most Egyptologists would agree that Akhenaten's religion was restricted to the latter. And indeed, Akhenaten himself restricts the true understanding of religion to himself and his immediate family. And that's it. And people are lucky to be able to witness his body and to, to glean information from his mind such that they can understand the true nature of God. But without his presence on the earth, only I can fix it kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? Without his presence, there would be no real understanding of what divinity actually was. He's clear on that point. So this is not a religion meant to spread at a grassroots level. It's not mm -hmm. a religion of salvation meant to to save everybody it's a religion of power a mm -hmm. religion of authoritarian imposition uh, a religion to impose change and kind of it, as i argue in the book it's a religion that's a kind of you could put it into the modern authoritarian understanding of the big lie a way of understanding who's loyal and who's not who is actually going to support you and who's not if an elite says, oh, this is crazy, then you know that elite is not going to support you and many other different things. You move that elite aside, you replace them with somebody who will be loyal and who will be a yes man. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is that, um, that moment where Egyptians are meant to, they're meant to choose. They're meant to pick between something that they grew up with, that they understand will be their salvation in the next life and help them to, to move into the very dangerous journey in the afterlife or they, they choose Akhenaten's religion in a, a wealthy lifestyle in the here and now. So this is about the elites. And it's interesting that when you look at the archeological evidence, you can see where Aten is imposed. It's chiefly in his new capital city of Akhet Aten called um, Tel El Amarna or just Amarna mm -hmm. in, in much of the Egyptological literature, the name of the modern site. And, and maybe in places like um, ancient Thebes, modern day Luxor, Heliopolis, Memphis, there does seem to be an injection of the Aten religion in those places. But even in Akhet Aten, where his elites were loyal to him, you have, you have elements of the old ways still there. You find figurines of different divinities. You find people holding on to uh, the, the religion that they were brought up with and not relinquishing that. So th those finds at, at Tel El Amarna, or just Amarna, I should say, it's the new, the new way of saying it, to just take the tell out, there's no tell. Um, the, the archeological finds at Amarna have been evidence for some that it's not monotheism. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't monotheism. I, I, I mean, for you, you can argue that, but I, I think it's pretty clear in the text in Akhenaten's mind 
that this is meant to be a monotheistic thing. Whether that is accepted by people, that's a very different question. Mm -hmm. So um, those two things can't be conflated. And as I say in the, the book, The Good Kings, one of the reasons we have such a hard time accepting this as monotheism is because it's not the monotheism we want. It's not the one we want to see. It's something that has a very different inception, a political inception, a, um, a top-down imposition, um, coerced inception. And so we we would rather run from that and say, oh, no, no, this isn't monotheism, even though it mm -hmm. tells us outright that it is. So it's our dissembling and our lack of um, ability to look at what monotheism does and why it does this to people and why it is so useful for those who push it on people. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Thank you. And to kind of pick up your your example of Catholicism, I know, uh, like I have a an amulet of uh, I think Saint John that my mother uh, we're not Catholic, but that my mother gave me when I came to live in the states. Yeah, you need that Doesn't from all mean, the yeah. all the guns. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your mom right. she's right on. <laughs> right, um, and I I know that like having amulets and having icons is a thing that many branches of Christianity do. And like you said, we still accept that as as monotheism. So I, I think that's a, a very good point that just because there are icons and, and amulets doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't be considered monotheism. Um, just briefly, uh, you said that um, uh, Akhenaten's religion framed him or he framed it as uh, him being the 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 one conduit to God and, and to um the divine that's that's not a massive departure from what came before is it my understanding of egyptian religion is that the the pharaoh had a, a like a supreme position as high priest and and connection to the divine that other mortal people don't don't share you're absolutely right the the elite religion the restricted knowledge that is um kept very close to the vest by by the ancient Egyptians from the pyramid text to the coffin text, the book of the dead, to all of the underworld books, litanies of the sun, um, different rituals. All of these things are closely guarded and the king as chief priest is the one who is meant to, the, really the only pure um, uh, good God who can connect with the great gods in the heavens. He is the, the only one that can really do this. However, as, and, and you could argue that that's the inception of a dynasty zero Egyptian religion, which is a very interesting question and something I would leave to my colleagues who specialize in pre-dynastic material. But um, I think a lot of organized religions probably have these beginnings in political power as, mm -hmm. a, as a means of showing the... Uh, the restricted knowledge that the leader has and the reason why everyone must end up bowing down to that leader. This is the beginnings of something new, which means that Akhenaten is, is dissatisfied with the amount that this restricted knowledge has filtered into the elite populace such that he cannot control it as one person. He cannot monopolize it. He can't um, commodify it and dole it out in restricted amounts the way that one could earlier. It's it's an attempt for a new start, I think. And, you know, given that we're talking about thousands of years after the beginnings of kingship in Egypt and the, the first creation of that priest king in the Egyptian landscape, I think this is an attempt to push back against how much power had gone in, and this is not a new argument, mm -hmm. right? How much power had gone into the priesthood, how much power elites were now holding as they spoke to their ancestors or the divinities directly. Um, there, there is an attempt to, to cut that off, to cut that access off um, and create a channel that, that must go through the king in a way that it hadn't been, even though it should. Akhenaten decides with his new name, he's Amenhotep IV before this, right? But Akhenaten decides not to go along with the polytheism of Amun, Amun Re, um, Horus, Isis, all of these different divinities and try to lock it down. He sees that, that as a rather lost cause. In the same way he sees eventually trying to inject this new religion into Memphis, Heliopolis and Thebes as a lost cause. Mm -hmm. And he wipes the slate clean as so many authoritarians do and, and creates a new start. Um, someplace else and with something else, something that's, that's very new. And that's why, it is a process during his 17 year reign that you can see that he becomes more extreme, more restricted um, and 
monopolizes the the information that much more. So it, it while at the same time taking away the power, cutting it off at the knees, if you will, of the old polytheistic system, saying there are no icons, there are no statues, there are no sanctuaries. It's up there. You can see it. It's warming your skin. Mm -hmm. I know you can't talk to it, so come to me. <laughs> right. So he's he's trying to remove all of those different avenues to power that so many priests and elites uh and and stewards and and um treasury holders had held before and and make it come just to him. Oh, I've lost you. I can't I can't actually hear you. Sorry. No. That's oh, good. Sorry. I, got, I, mute, I, got, I, I mute myself to try and cut down on child noise, and then I oh, typically, I see. Typically, no. forget that I've done that, and then start talking. And people are like I, no, I do what you're saying. I am um, a twelve year old, so I, I completely understand <laughs> completely. And he has interrupted um, multiple talks and interviews that I've done, and everyone's like, "Oh, is Julian there today?" No, he's in school. <laughs> so that's that's great. Yeah, yeah I, I I know that feeling. Oliver is four and regularly just yeah. Blasts they don't care. through the door and is like, hi, I'm going to talk to the internet now. No, you're not, child. Go. <laughs> Go. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, the other side of this conversation then is Israelite monotheism, which yeah. looks very different. Yeah. Um, do you think that... Um, okay, so I'm trying to think about how to word this. Um, this is where it gets tricky. It, yes, this is where it, it gets really, really tricky. If it what really we does. just talked about was rather controversial... And it is rather controversial, this whole monotheism thing. What we're about to jump into is like, yeah, let's just throw a bomb into the middle of the I street. will not be reading the comments <laughs> of this, uh, this uh, stream after we finish. Let's um, see. <laughs> what kinds of contacts then? Let's let's start at, at the bottom. What kinds of contacts did Egypt have with um, Canaan and the, and the Levant during this period? Yeah, many, so many. And they're long lived contacts. They go on for millennia. And you could start those contacts in the early bronze and you could continue into the middle bronze with the, the Hyksos, these foreign kings and their control of the Delta and competition with Theban kings. Um, you could continue that into the Amarna period where you have close contacts with uh, West Asia, um, Levantine peoples. And then of course, when you move into the Ramesid period, you have kings on the throne who name themselves Seth, which is essentially like saying, hey, my name's Baal. How you doing? I'm from the Eastern Delta. Um, and, you know, the Thebans, as, as has been argued by Dr. Danny Candelora, um, a UCLA alumna, th they could have been perceived as more Levantine than Egyptian in, mm -hmm. in some ways. And that's an interesting way of looking at the Ramesses, which means this time period in which most people try to situate the exodus, whatever that process and cultural memory are, um, is, is happening during a time when Egypt is closest culturally, geographically to West Asia. Their capital, Per Ramses, is in the Eastern Delta. It's very close to Avaris. It's practically identical with Tel Adeba and Kantir is. And so how are we to understand this competition um, or disassociation between these slightly Levantine, but then still more Egyptian than Egyptian Ramesid kings, and then all of the Levantine people, first generation Levantine people whom they employ, mm -hmm. because there's all kinds of butlers in 20th dynasty texts in particular, um, from the Turin judicial papyrus, for example, that have uh, Semitic names or West Asian names, and how is one to understand these interchanges? Um, there's the 19th dynasty civil wars between Seti II of the north, um, ostensibly of, of Per Ramses, the Eastern Delta, and Amun Mesu of Thebes. And what is this civil war about? Who is related to Ramses II and in, in what way? They're probably both related to him in some way, but one considers themselves of the Eastern Delta um, side and the other one is of the Theban side. Amun Mesu's name for short in Dira Medina is Mesu. So one could make Moses connections there. I, I'm not going to try to do that, but it's mm -hmm. interesting that the mm -hmm. only person in our story who could actually, who actually is called a Moses in a way, or Mesu, is a, a king of Egypt um, who lost in the civil war and goes who knows where, but disappears. Um, 
there, there's a lot that one can do to situate a zeitgeist in which these um, Levantine connections are are happening. But then, you know, if if in this um, maelstrom of competition, civil war, the fall, the slow train wreck of the Egyptian monarchy, because that's what's happening at the end of Dynasty 19 and into Dynasty 20. It is a slow train wreck of pharaonic power failure. That is um, an interesting way of, tr of, how does one transmit a failed religion of a king that everyone wants to forget and call a heretic? How does something like that last and then move across the, the Sinai into the Levant and find a new life, if that's indeed what mm -hmm. happens. I don't have the answers for that. We're talking about hundreds of years in between, but I also don't, but I also note the strong similarities between something like Psalm 104 and the great hymn to the Aten. No, it's not exact word for word, but there are phrases in there in succession that are too close, in my opinion, to just be discounted as um, accident happen chance it's it's too it's too perfect and so mm -hmm. some sort of transmission textual transmission oral transmission for some reason is happening and it's um it's it's very uh puzzling and i, I you know because so many of these things are happening in the context of things falling apart it's not um something that you can as easily follow Mm -hmm. But that's where so much negotiation and creative negotiation is happening. Mm -hmm. Do we have, um, I'm assuming the answer is no going into this question. Do we have reference or evidence of the art and being known outside of Egypt? Probably, yes. Um, the Aten is not a new god that Akhenaten mm -hmm. creates. It is the visible sun in the sky. It is usually put in the text as sun disk in the literature, in our literature. But the Egyptians, when they depict the Aten in relief, they give it a curvature. And it is quite possible that the Egyptians understood this as a globe. That that part doesn't really matter. Um, and we could talk about the scientific acumen of ancient peoples. All, you know, They weren't stupid people and they <laughs> understood more than, than we yeah. give them credit for much of the time. Um, to call it the sun disk, and even though I do in, in much of my writing, uh, smacks of um, of a lack of understanding on the Egyptian part. Let's us be modern and exceptional, and oh well, we know it's not a disc. Those silly Egyptians. But but in short, the Aten is nothing more than the visible sun in the sky, the sun that warms you, the sun that you can see with your eyes, the sun that when it goes away is not there. And solar cults are ubiquitous. They are associated with power and authoritarianism. Sun kings are everywhere. The sun is associated with gold, it is associated with money, it is associated with monopolizations of power, it is associated with uh, military force, it is um, it is associated with those that one man who can look at the sun in a way where everyone else cannot. Um, and if he is the sun king, then people cannot look at him. Um, he is too bright to behold. It is associated with ego. It is um, associated with manliness, the, the moon being that more feminine aspect and the sun being that patriarchal power. So I, I don't think um, it would be hard to translate this idea cross-culturally at all. This, mm -hmm. is, this is something that you could, you know, like Herodotus coming into Egypt and saying, oh yeah, their Amun is my Zeus, got it, great. This is something that would very easily be, um, translated to multiple different peoples and would be useful mm -hmm. to multiple different peoples in power. And as we can see in the Hebrew Bible, it is taken up by, in a different way, first through a kingship, and I'm not, I'm no scholar of the ancient um, Hebrew Bible, but taken up by a king and, and priests simultaneously in competition with one another. But it's used as a tool of power, this monotheism. And it's also not fully formed. It's also a process. It's also not monotheism right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So we could look at the Hebrew Bible and say, oh, it's not monotheism. Look, there's a golden calf and there's this, and this king's not doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord and second kings, blah, blah, blah. That that exists. And yet nobody says, oh, but it's not monotheistic. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we do that for Akhenaten's experiment 
and only lasts a short time. It's gone after, but is it gone? Where does it go? Um, my you call him a heretic, but you know, these things do, some things do show up in Manetho and it's, it's, there, there's some way of recording these things that is very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have uh, maybe one more question uh, for Dr. Cooney. So uh, audience, if you have questions, now's the time to get them in. Otherwise, uh, after my question, we will say goodbye and let her go and, and get on with the rest of her day. Um, do we see um, Akhenaten being remembered later? You've, you've said that he's he's often called a heretic by, by later people. Is he ever rem remembered um, fondly or is it always just we're not talking about this man no it's always we're not talking about this man very negative negative um somebody who can't even be named like voldemort you know it's um it's that and and then you know jan osman created a, an incredible career looking at the ramesid period as as a time period when people were trying to intellectually and spiritually square the trauma that they had experienced during the Amarna period. So his wake was strong and arguably one could say still being felt today. So you can try to ignore him, but once that very, in my opinion, once that very powerful genie is let out of the bottle, that you can monopolize religion such that it works for political power in this way, people are going to keep wanting to grab it onto that. Um, whether they intellectually say, ah, yes, one God, I get it. This is going to work. People don't, people generally don't work that way. They organically move towards systems that give them a different kind of power that is unassailable. And I think that's what's going on. So Akhenaten, the person can be made into a heretic, reviled and forgotten, but what he created has legs and still has legs and is um, continuing to make itself felt in the world. Um, I think as I, as I say in the book, it's no surprise to me that monotheism is created within a political matrix of trying to uh, construct a power grab. It's, it's, it's still used that way. Thank you. So we do have um, a couple of audience questions. Um, thank you, uh, JS, who, sorry, let me just find it so I can get it on the screen. There we go. Um, so a little oh, bit you're outside. so fancy. So <laughs> fancy. It's automatically done for me. I just have to click Amazing. the button. Um, it's a little bit outside exactly what we've been talking about, but I think syn religious syncretization is, is something that we have touched on. So was Baal ever compared to Horus as they're both warrior gods who rose to prominence through combat in their own mythology? No, JS, um, no. But if this is a there's a very interesting answer to this question. Horus fights Baal. Um, Baal is associated with Seth. They are both gods of desert, of storm, of thunder and lightning, of, of great power, um, sometimes brute force. Sometimes they're not considered very smart, these, these divinities. Horus is um, the son of Osiris and is a more um, clever, intellectual and legal heir of his father Osiris. And I would encourage you to pick up a copy of the ancient Egyptian literature. There's many different translations. William Kelly Simpson is one. There is Miriam Lichtheim, that's always my favorite. And look at the tale um, called The Contendings or The Fightings of Horus and Seth. And you will read a very body, sexy, amazing tale that must have been um, rip roaring to hear at the campfire. It must have been just great. And, and you've got, you know, um, Seth attempting to rape Horus. You've got them making stone boats to fight each other and or, or boats and then Seth's a stone and it sinks. It's wonderful. It's it, it's funny. And, and you will see that Seth is associated with the desert and with the Eastern desert in particular. So you have this Egyptian God who is, um, who is, you know, associated with the foreign, with the un-Egyptian, but he is necessary. That God Seth is there at the prow of Amun Ray's boat, as he goes into the deep dark watches of, of night to fight against Apophis and nihilistic non-existence. And it's Seth who is able to spear Apophis and make the journey safe for the sun god. So this brute force is absolutely necessary and it's what enables Horus to then take the throne. Um, all of these things coexist even though they're often in competition with one Thank another. You. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Mark, who is watching on Facebook, hello, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Um, 
is there is there any like actual thread from Alkanaten to Judaism? He says he's guessing no. No, no, but you know how weird you've got this hymn to the Aten and then you've got Psalm 104 and th there are these connections and how does this actually happen? Your guess is as good as mine and we can go with oral transmissions and maybe some text transmissions and maybe um, some priests who were a part of the Amarna regime fled um, as the regime fell and, and took their texts and their ideas with them. Who knows? Um, there, there's a lot of back and forth, toing and froing um, from, from West Asia to North Africa and how, how these things work, um, probably over many years and probably percolating um, in people's minds for, for some time. Thank you. Um, and Brian also on Facebook says, do you have a comment on the similarities, oh gosh, uh, of centralizing the sun in Neo-Paleolithic of the British Isles with monuments, ritual sites and jewelry and the ma metallurgy practices of ancient Egyptians? New studies of ancient trades suggest heavy trades of skills, ideas and rituals. I'm not sure yeah. if you were asking if there was like trade between Britain and Egypt that included skill trading? Or just that, we're, you know, if you're looking at Stonehenge or something like that, you're looking at a monument that can track the sun. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's fine. There are many cultures that have monuments that track the sun. So if Stonehenge is what you have in the British Isles in Egypt, there are days when the sun goes right down the central axis of Karnak Temple. And it's meant to do that. And it's going to happen twice a year. And it's those are important equinox days. And it's built that way on purpose. And it's built so that the sun will slant into certain areas. Much more work needs to be done on, on solar movements and temples in Egypt. It's avoided, I think, because it smacks of pseudoscience and a lot of the, the pyram pyramid idiot kind of um, stream. And so people don't do it. But I think it would be a very interesting research project to take on. Thank you. Uh, Dan is asking, did the Egyptians or other cultures syncretize foreign gods like the Greeks and Romans did? Yeah, um, you know, Seth in and of itself is a foreign, he is a foreign god. He is not of Egypt in many ways. And he brings with him all of the innovation and brute force and um, desert power that you get from the outside, but you don't have within Egypt. And the Egyptians know they need that. Within Egypt, you've got this this Nile Valley that's fertile, it's easy to farm. Herodotus is like, really? You just scatter the seeds and that's it? You don't have to move any rocks. There's no plowing, what the hell? And it means lack of competition. It means lots of napping. It means lack of, of fighting with one another. That's nice, but um, a culture probably knows they need um, to manufacture competition to get a good fighting force, to be able to go into the outside world. It's interesting that the Egyptians manufacture this outsider god to take on that, that role. And um, Seth is not often syncretized with other divinities uh, the way the sun god is, which is interesting. That's that's its own um, paper topic. And, and wouldn't that be interesting for somebody to take on why the sun god is so often associated with Amen Min, Amen Re, um, the Re Harakti. You know, why are there these syncretisms for the sun god, and yet the desert god in the Egyptian system doesn't get those same kinds of of syncretisms? Um, and the ancient Egyptians included foreign gods in in their pantheon and in their worship with no problem. So if you go to Dir el Medina, you can see Astarte being being worshipped, um, and and there's no um, proto-nationalism to say that that's not appropriate or or is wrong in some way. So um, it does it does absolutely happen. These lines are drawn by us and they are artificial lines. And in the ancient Egyptian world, um, things were arguably much more fluid. I'm not trying to say that lines didn't exist. Mm. The ancient Egyptians of the Nile Valley knew they were of the Nile Valley and those desert people were other. And they did draw that line very starkly between red land and black land. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't bring some of those divinities into the black land space. Thank you. And a, a similar question again from Dan. Um, were all the gods of Egypt aspects of Amun-Ra? I like this question because I think that there's another aspect to this whole monotheism that I need to touch on. And there is a, a famous hymn that's on a papyrus currently in Leiden in the Netherlands. And that hymn includes a section, it's a Ramesid hymn, um, 19th or 20th dynasty, probably 
um, 19th, maybe written down in the 20th. I, I'd have to check. But it, it says, all gods are three, Amen, Re, and Ptah. And then it says that Amen is the, wait, Re is the body, Ptah is the face, and Amen is something. I, I have to look, and I'm sorry, I can't remember this off the top of my head. But essentially, the hymn is saying that all gods are one that you put these divinities together and you get one body, um, a mind, a head, a, a shape, a form, and, and they're all these three masculine gods that you put together, which shows the Egyptian anxiety, in my opinion, of understanding exactly how powerful that monotheistic idea is, such that they're trying to manufacture it out of the polytheistic pieces that they have. Mm -hmm. And I've encountered this in the modern world. For example, when I went to um, Sri Lanka for a TV show I did a long time ago. And I would talk to priests and ask about the temple and how things work and who's God of this or that. And I remember um, some people telling me, no, no, there is one source. Yes, there are many dif different divinities and we have Vishnu and we have Kali and we have um, this divinity and that divinity, but they are all one source. So there is an anxiety. I think that we don't exactly know how to verbalize or intellectualize, but the, we understand viscerally that this monotheism has a leg up on polytheism in terms of power, in terms of its inviolability. Uh, for whatever reason, that's it's very, very interesting to me and something I, I often ponder in um, the United States as we um, submit so much to an evangelical political monotheism in this country. Um, but there, there are people living in polytheistic systems in the past and in the present who try to then move those different divinities into a monotheistic rubric such that they can compete with those monotheistic elements because it is so useful to them. Um, and I find that I find that really interesting. So Amun Ray is a he's a part of this, and Amun Ray of the Ramesid period is very much an answer to to the monotheism of Akhenaten. It's like, oh, you think this works? Okay, watch what we do with Amun Ray. And the priests manufacture a cult that is able to go out into the Egyptian world and take over other cults in Tanis and Per Ramses and other parts of the Delta. Um, and and you know, you're starting to see temples being built uh, in in the Ta um, Patah uh, complex at, at Memphis, for example. Um, in the Elephantini complex uh, for for Knum and others. And Amun is infiltrating, if you like, into all of these different spaces. Mm -hmm. And I would argue it's because of how uh, effective the priests are at manufacturing a kind of monotheism out of out of that cult. That's yeah. very interesting. You see something similar. They don't take it to the same level, but you see something similar in Mesopotamia where you have in certain mythologies one single god is given all the names of other gods. I mean, you see it in Enuma Elish with Marduk. And it's yeah. it's a movement towards monotheism, but I, I don't think they ever get to the same level. Yeah. Of or the litany of Re. I love yeah. look at look up the litany of Ray. Do a quick Google search on that. And you'll see that it's it's the 75 different manifestations of the sun. Some mm -hmm. of them male, some of them female, some of them animal, some of them human, but the sun can take all of these different divinities into himself. And you might see a God that, oh, that looks like a Ram God. Is it Amun? Is it Knum? Not sure. That looks like Bastet. But it means that the sun can then pull all of these different elements into himself. You can see a Chthonic Osirian-like divinity, but all of these things are possible. So there's, um, there's great attempts to manufacture this. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting how people just seem to know that this is, this is very useful theology. Thank you. Uh, we will take maybe one or two more questions. So I'm sorry, everyone, if you have not got your questions in yet, the time is is now over because otherwise I suspect we would keep Dr. Cuny here for several hours. <laughs> and um, that probably is not terribly polite. Um, no Name is asking, can Dr. Kara tell us any similarities between dogma, uh, doctrine, rights, or practices uh, between Artenism and early Judaism? I can't. I can't. Um, I mean... Yeah, the, I don't, see, uh, what is religion of Atonism, right? It The practicalities in my mind are filling altars out in the open sun with masses of food 
which is essentially showing a prosperity gospel. This is what I argue in the in the Good Kings that these religions, these monotheistic religions, are also connected to a monopolization of resources, money, um, and it's it makes sense then that Akhenaten's main ritual that he shows is filling a table of offerings and holding them up to the sun's rays. And the sun's rays then eat, in a sense, those offerings. And on great festival days, he would fill hundreds of altars in an open solar court with this great bounty. It, it makes her a very messy reversion of offerings. A reversion of offerings is an, an age old Egyptian way of redistributing wealth to priests and people who are working in the temples. And it would normally happen in a place where incense is used to keep flies away in an inner temple space in an offering hall that is not open to direct sunlight, such that the food is not going to easily rot. You don't wanna put a bloody haunch of beef out in the open sunlight, it's, that's not gonna be pretty. And it is indeed what Akhenaten does. Um, it's like, and, and, and I've gotten great pushback for this, people saying, oh no, it wasn't that bad. He was all about bounty and showing what he had. But in a way he's like, watch the food rot and look at what I can do. Now you cross me, you'll know, I, this is mine. And, and the waste in authoritarian regimes and showing that waste is very often purposefully done to give an idea of the power that, that a leader has. Now, is there anything like that in Judaism? Um, you know, there's sacrifices, uh, there's, there's sac which aren't performed anymore, but are certainly mm -hmm. there in the biblical um, text uh sacrifices that are very hard to bear sacrifices of only sons sacrifices of precious animals um maybe there is an association there this is where work needs to be done and where i would advise that we don't need one-to-one -one correspondences because monotheism is so powerful as a political tool that you would want to take that idea and then you would insert it into your own cultural economic milieu such that it would work better for you there. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you necessarily need to take the way it would have worked in Egypt and then inject that into the Levant in the same way. There's, there's very little um, orthodoxy to something that's so fresh and new. There's much more negotiability, much more flexibility. So you just have the really two main ideas. It's like sun god and one god. And, and that's kind of it. And, and this idea of monopolizing those two, um, the, the main thing that I think of for Jewish ritual is, and this is my own simple understanding. I, again, I'm not a specialist in ancient Judaism or the, or the Hebrew Bible, but it's a religion of laws. It's a religion of what you cannot do as much as what you can do and how something must be done by a specialist, which is, a monopolization of power. It's a way of saying you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that, you cannot dress this way, you cannot have sex in this way, you cannot marry that person, you can't eat this apple. Um, and it's it's very restrictive. And so you you have to double think everything that you're doing in your life to figure out whether you are good with God. And that is an a creation, um, in my opinion, an overlay of power that makes it so that you cannot connect directly with God. You have to do so through a legal rubric and through um, specialists of those laws and specialists of those rituals. And that is in a way very broadly understood um, a monopolization of of that religious power. So Thank that's how I'm going to dodge much. that question. No, that's <laughs> excellent answer. Um, we have uh, one more question uh, from Everyone Needs a Smile. In your studies, do you find major leaders being more or less religious and some being true believers versus, versus some just using the religion for political gain? Um, I think that I'm going to back this up and say that religion is too easy. There are many leaders who don't use religion but who are using ideology um, nationalist ideology, political ideology, the very ideology of democracy in my, in my eyes right now is made religious. It is made into an orthodoxy that is, it doesn't even resemble itself um, mm -hmm. anymore. It is, it is simply a figment of our imaginations. It's not real. It's just something that we speak about and talk about that we must do. We do democracy. We are democracy. And there are many uh, countries on this globe that say they are democracies and are anything but and and veer towards authoritarian power. So uh, what what I see 
today, and which is the question, yes, um, mm -hmm. yeah. in, in modern politics, is um, in these times of anxiety as we are destroying the planet um, and putting most resources into the hands of a select few, is creating an ideology around those select few such that they can keep those resources. And in my country, you see things like, you know, taxes being the, being the devil, truly. <laughs> Even mm -hmm. though taxes are a, a means of taking in wealth and redistributing that wealth for the, for the majority of people rather than um, just the few, but not having those taxes is considered the ideological whole good because then you're giving more money to jobs creators, right? They're creating jobs. They're the good ones. They're the only ones who can fix it. And we need to listen to them. There is also an unspoken, whether you bring religion into it or not, prosperity gospel that, that Americans love. So you can have somebody like Jeff Bezos, who is literally, a, in my mind, a, a kind of king with his over $300 billion. And, and yet we're you know, he's not associated with evangelical Christianity. He owns the Washington Post, which is a very left-wing rag, but he's still there setting himself up as one of those, those billionaires that has been blessed by the heavens uh, in some way, and thus we must obey and serve and, and get our, our, ironic, right? Get our Starbucks and do what we're told and at least we get benefits here or whatever. But, um, so I would look much broader than religion. Religion is certainly a part of it. And religion in the United States is um, a, a veil for people who are trying to keep their oligarchic, um, tax-free white supremacy in, in this country. Um, but there, but so is a flyover of F-15s over an NFL football game. Um, it's It's a similar use of ideology, it, it, as Michael Mann says in his, in his book, The Sources of Social Power, which I use all the time, uh, ideology cannot be proven nor disproven, and it allows people to act against their own self-interests. Mm -hmm. It gets people to act against their own self-interests, and it, it, it makes people do things for uh, one person in power that they would not otherwise do, and they can't even recognize that mm -hmm. they're doing that. Um, so, you know, you have a bunch of uh, Americans right now who are pro-Trump, many of whom have no college education, who don't have benefits, who don't have good health care, and yet they're willing to submit their lives in, in revolution, as January 6th tells us, for a man who's going to take more of those things away from them. And that's ideology at work. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think that right there speaks to what you were saying earlier about how an understanding of the ancient past can help us look at and consider our current modern world. Um, so thank you. This has been a wonderful discussion. I've greatly enjoyed myself. The audience has greatly enjoyed themselves. Uh, we have one final comment from uh, Derek of Myth Vision, who is a lovely man and a good friend, saying just lovely things. So thank you for being thank so lovely. You. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Derek. And I think we will wrap up here. Dr. Cooney, thank you again for agreeing to come on and talk about a somewhat controversial topic. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, and actually people, if you have enjoyed listening to Dr. Cooney, she will be back on YouTube on Saturday, I believe at noon on uh, Jess's channel, that's Heathen Queen. I'm going to be helping her moderate a panel with Dr. Cooney, uh, Josh, Dr. Byrne, my husband, and uh, Mark Lucha. I always get his name wrong, but Dr. Lucha is a Hebrew Bible specialist talking about the Exodus. What evidence we have? Was it real? Is it kind of a misremembered half truth? Who knows? Uh, hopefully these three people will be able to help us talk about it. So uh, join us then. That will be lots of fun. Um, and until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Thank you. Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.